uh, with that, getting back to, to why I'm so honored to be here at this particular moment at Villanova, um, uh, obviously you're one of the most prominent Catholic universities uh, at a time when the head of the Catholic Church is unafraid to talk about human trafficking by its real name, which is slavery. Um, and before I, um, before I really launch into this, I want to be very clear what it is that I'm talking about when I say the word slavery, uh, because the term has become largely devalued in, in modern discourse. If you look up in Merriam-Webster dictionary today, the definition uh, that, is, that is first is drudgery or toil. It's, it's become a, a metaphor for, for undue hardship. I, I travel a lot, um, and one of my techniques for getting uh, sleep on flights is to tell people what I do. <laughs> um, uh, I was flying uh, a, a few years back uh, between Hong Kong and New York. Uh, I had to give uh, a talk at one end um, and had to work out a deal at the other, and I needed some sleep. Um, and uh, the typical um, New Yorker opening gambit of my slightly chatty seatmate was, well, what do you do? And I said, I'm a specialist in mass atrocities in modern day slavery and in child rape. Um, and that usually ends the conversation and then I can get some sleep. Um, as it turns out, she was, uh, you know, uh, not, gonna, not gonna take, uh, take that uh, 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 on its face. And she said, well, you know, modern day slavery, I know something about that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm in finance and uh, I have two mortgages and um, uh, you should see my, my credit card load. Uh, and I said, well, you know, that's, that's interesting. I, what I'm talking about, uh, the people that I'm talking about in the eyes of their employer are actually disposable. Um, they're, they're dispensable. And this was shortly after the onset of the financial crisis, and she was very sharp, and she said, well, you, you know, disposable? Did you know anybody that worked for Lehman Brothers? Uh, and, uh, you know, it was a much longer conversation that night. Uh, and. I, uh, I, didn't, uh, I didn't get much sleep, but hopefully by the, uh, the morning I made a convert, and, and hopefully, uh, hopefully for, the, um, for the few uninitiated here, uh, I can make a few more converts. What I'm talking about when I say slavery, slaves are those forced to work, held through fraud, under uh, threat of violence, for no pay beyond subsistence. These are, these are people that cannot walk away from their work. Um, and by that mere definition, there are more slaves today than at any point in human history. So where are these slaves? Uh, because at a time such as that's, that's portrayed in 12 Years a Slave, and those of you who haven't seen it, who have the stomach for it, I, I encourage you to go out and see it. Um, it'll win Best Picture, I'm sure, uh, or it should win Best Picture, and it's breathtaking. At that time, you could go out in parts of, of this country, and you could see slaves being sold on the auction block, you could see slaves working in the, in the fields, and you could readily identify them not only by the nature of their work, but by the color of their skin. Today, slaves are everywhere and nowhere. There are, uh, if you were to plot them on a map, you would have to put the most pins in South Asia, in the Indian subcontinent. And these are, these are slaves who, uh, in, the, in the deathless prose of the United Nations, are held in a form of slavery known as collateralized hereditary debt bondage, uh, which in no way describes the horror of what it is to be trapped in a, in a situation of, of debt. Uh, in many cases, a debt that you yourself wouldn't have taken, but your father or your grandfather would have taken uh, one, two. Uh, in some cases, I, I interviewed individuals who could trace the debt back seven generations. In one case, I, I, I interviewed a, a man who had been enslaved well before his birth, 
um, when his grandfather took a debt of 62 cents, um, uh, the equivalent of 62 cents in rupees. And two generations and two slave masters later, he was forced to pay off that debt doing very basic, simple work. Uh, everybody in his village uh, was enslaved to one of two brothers who were quarry contractors. And what the children would have to do is they would climb into small spaces, into crawl spaces, plant short fuse blasting explosives, and run. Um, and as you can imagine, this is not work for children. Uh, and the mortality rate, the injury rate was uh, higher than, than any of us want to imagine. Of course, there were no records of, of, the actual, uh, of the actual mortality rate for the slaves. Once the, once the rocks were blasted up out of the earth, the, uh, the, the villagers, again, all of whom were in debt bondage, would descend on these rocks with pikes and mortars. And they would break down the rocks into gravel, which was uh, and is today used as the subgrade for uh, many of India's infrastructure projects, uh, m many of their roads, their highway system, for example. And then further, they would pulverize the, those rocks down into sand, into silica sand, which is an element uh, in the manufacture of glass. And there's only one way in the modern world that you can turn a profit off of handmade sand, and that is through sheer, unmitigated, violent slavery. And the, the local police, uh, when I would go in uh, and talk to them, uh, would, would know very well who this man, who I call Ganu, um, uh, knew this, this man's uh, uh, slave master, the quarry contractor, and knew that he had killed uh, at least or had, uh, uh, had accused him uh, of killing um, at least five high caste Brahmin caste Indians, rival quarry contractors. And these were, these were murders that actually made it onto police ledgers. According to the, to the slaves, he had killed uh, at least a dozen uh, over the course of his 15, 16 year reign of terror. Uh, but their deaths had never, never been reported. Uh, they were in the eyes of the, of the police, uh, along with that of those of the contractors, they were dispensable. So. I would go in and talk to Ganu at night. And one of the things that always was vexing for me, I had been, I'd been reading um, on the trains in India, I'd been reading the, uh, the, the writings uh, and the speeches of Mahatma Gandhi. Uh, and I came on this, this phrase that Gandhi used that, that I thought was, was, was breathtaking. And and he said, when a slave decides not to be a slave, the bond is snapped and the fetters fall. Slavery and freedom are mental constructs. And it was a, it was a stunning uh, piece for me to hold on to and chew on, and I turned it over in my head, and I went in uh, one night. I would go in at night and interview Ganu in his, in his uh, very low-lying hut. It was... Um, it was about this high, you couldn't stand up all the way in it. Um, and he had a family of, of, uh, of four uh, living there. Um, and, I, and I said, look, I can come in at night. Why don't you run? Why don't you go? Why don't you take your family to Delhi and pull a rickshaw? Um, live poor, but live free. And the second thing that he said was, Ramesh and, and his mafia will find me wherever I go. Um, they are, they're thugs, they're brutal, they have a network that spans this country. But the first thing that he said, the first words on his lips were, where would I go and how would I eat? And what struck me in that moment was that while for the Mahatma, slavery and freedom were mental constructs, for Ganu, slavery was his world. And to him, Ramesh was God in that world. He was not only 
the, the taker of life, but he was also the giver of sustenance. And so when we think about why over 150 years after the Emancipation Proclamation, the 13th Amendment, why, when we think about why there are more slaves today than at any point in human history, we have to think about these cycles of dependence and we have to think about how to break them. So looking across the globe, the, the, the more salient form of slavery, partly because the media has picked up on it, partly because uh, international institutions have put more energy beh behind fighting it, uh, is uh, again uh, another euphemism uh, to describe it, human trafficking, which is essentially the, the recruitment, the transport, or the harboring of individuals for the purpose of turning them into slaves. Uh, the estimates are, uh, and again these are estimates, that there are between 800,000 up to 2 million that are trafficked across international borders every year. Right here in the United States, uh, including right here in the state of Pennsylvania, right here uh, in, in, our, in our own backyard, uh, there are between 14 and 17,000 that are trafficked in the United States every year. Uh, put another way, uh, if I'm talking here for half an hour, on average in that half hour, uh, one more person will have become a slave. So what I set out to do with this book um, and what I set out to do subsequently in my writing for Time Magazine, for Bloomberg Business Week, uh, was to, to try to move beyond the statistics, um, to try to get to a, a point where, um, where I could actually describe people's lives and, and, and move uh, readers to action. Anytime you're going to quote Joseph Stalin, you have to qualify it. Um, and many times it's the worst people that have the best quotes. Uh, but Stalin was supposed to, Stalin who knew something about mass killing, of course, um, uh, was supposed to have said that the death of a million men is a statistic and the death of one man is a tragedy. Uh, what I wanted to do was go out and find uh, uh, one slave like Ganu and tell the tragedy, the struggle of, of his existence. I wanted to find survivors. I wanted to find traffickers as well. I wanted to talk to those that were actually buying and selling human beings. And as part of that, I was the witness to the sale of, of human beings on, on several continents, the negotiations for the sale. I did not ever buy a human being. Other journalists who've been in my position have crossed that line. For ethical reasons, I felt that to do that would possibly narrowly be giving rise to a trade in human misery, even if by doing so I could shock more uh, into action. I felt that the, the, the first role of my, in my work, much as the first role uh, in many of the work that, that you all are taking in the, in the healthcare profession, is to do no harm and to, to seek uh, to, to ameliorate suffering. Um, so that's a very uh, and I'm sure those of you who've done residencies, internships, um, uh, will discover that what you learn in school um, uh, will abide, uh, but sometimes it's tested. In fact, it's very often tested. Um, when I was uh, working as a journalist, uh, it was uh, tested uh, often, and in particular, I'd like to talk about one night. Uh, if we could bring down the lights just a tiny bit, um, I think it might be easier to see the screen here. Um, uh, one night in central Bloemfontein in South Africa. Um, so I was, I was on assignment for a time um, and I had been for about three weeks at this point, I'd been in a, um, uh, on the trail of a, of a particular human trafficking outfit that had been very active um, uh, in the run-up to the 2010 World Cup. Um, and they had been preparing for what they hoped were, was going to be an uptick in 
in demand for the girls that they were selling on the street. Um, they had begun their operations several years earlier when they had, uh, when they had uh, uh, realized that it was a safe way to protect their income from the crack trade to uh, roll that into the flesh trade to sell girls on the street. The reason was pretty simple. Uh, the South African government, um, RSA police, uh, would crack down heavily on the drug trade, but at the time there was no standalone law against human trafficking in South Africa. And so this was a way to protect their profits and to, whereas uh, they could sell a bindle of crack for the equivalent of uh, $50 in Rand, um, they could, in some cases, buy a girl for, uh, for as little as, as $100 or $75 uh, and then sell her over and over again until she wound up in a situation like Sindiswa. So in the middle, um, in the middle of this, uh, I wound up uh, in a, uh, a state-run hospice um, in central Bloemfontein. And uh, as, far as, I, as far as I knew from the nurses, um, everybody in this hospice was dying um, of some form of complications because of HIV. Um, any of you who've done any work in or around South Africa uh, know that it has one of the highest rates of HIV infection in the world. Um, and when you are a, um, a uh, when you're working in the sex trade, uh, your, your likelihood obviously goes up very high of contracting uh, the virus. And when you're trafficked as a young girl, as was Sindiswa, it, it, is, uh, it is that, it is almost uh, a certainty uh, that you will contract the virus. Sindiswa uh, had been sold two and a half years earlier. She, uh, she's 16 years old here. Um, she'd been sold two and a half years earlier uh, uh, when she'd been recruited out of a township in Eastern Cape, one of the poorest, uh, one of the poorest states in, in South Africa. And she, uh, she'd been told that she would be working in a restaurant. Um, and when she got to Bloemfontein, which was some eight hours drive from her township, um, uh, where she was barely scraping by as an orphan, um, when, she, when she got to Bloemfontein, uh, she was sold for $35, uh, along with her best friend, who I call Elizabeth. Uh, and a bag of crack given to the recruiter who was uh, a, a crack addict, uh, which she didn't obviously know from the outset. Um, after two and a half years of being forced to service um, uh, multiple men uh, throughout, uh, throughout the evenings, after at least one escape attempt, Elizabeth had tried to run away three times um, uh, at a certain point, Cindy Swood just didn't have the fight in her. Um, she uh, wound up not being able to stand anymore. Um, she, uh, uh, her trafficker, a man named Jude, kicked her out on the street. Um, and a Good Samaritan took her into a hospital. The hospital very quickly realized that with uh, full-blown tuberculosis um, uh, and uh, AIDS, uh, she didn't have long, and they put her into a state-run hospice. Her belly was a little distended here, um, and we didn't know why. She said she was hungry. I went out and got her some. She wanted fried chicken, which didn't seem like something that you'd want to eat when your belly's distended, but she just hadn't had it in, in years. Um, so I got it for her, and the next day, it turned out the reason her belly was distended was because she was three months pregnant. Um, and... Um, her name, funnily enough, um, uh, poignantly, I should say, enough, means saved. Um, and uh, I was, these photos were taken by uh, my photographer on the assignment, uh, a woman named Melanie Hammond, um, 
who uh, I, I, I had a, I have a principle along with um, not buying people of never exposing um, child victims. Um, the reason why I exposed Sindiswa was because, um, and why I show, I'm showing her face here, was because she specifically asked me to, to remember uh, her and to remind people that she existed. The, um, the, um, the evening that I, that I found her, a, uh, uh, a man came in after, after I'd been talking to her. As I was fin finishing up the conversation, um, uh, she turned to me and she said, Thank, uh, she said uh, actually, I prompted by a question that I asked, I said, well, is, is there one thing that, you know, in the half an hour of, our, of us talking that you haven't said that you'd want three million readers of Time Magazine to know about your life? And she said, uh, I don't know what to say to them, um, but I know what to say to you. Thank you for listening to my story because nobody ever has. Um, uh, shortly after that, a man came in um, named Andre Lombard. And um, Pastor Lombard was a uh, street pastor who worked um, in central Bloemfontein and had a very uh, distinctive background that made him, um, that drew him to this work and gave him a unique skill set that was appropriate for this work, I think. Um, he was He'd been born in an abusive household with an alcoholic father who'd beaten his uh, mother in front of him repeatedly. And uh, at, at age 16, he moved out of the house um, with a fire in his belly against uh, men who hurt women. And he, um, he joined the Special Forces. He learned, um, uh, uh, he, he, he then, um, uh, after his time in the service, um, uh, came out and began his street ministry. And his, um, uh, his work had, um, funnily enough, sort of dovetailed with mine and we'd wound up at the same place. He'd, he'd heard there was a young woman that um, was, was dying alone and, and, and he was uh, interested in bringing her a message. I was interested in taking a message from her. Um, and we wound up... Um, walking around that night. At the end of the conversation, when she began to fade, he said, where is the trafficker? And his, his intonation was just like that. It was flat. It was, it was more declarative than interrogative. Um, the way he operated was he trained uh, the other street pastors in um, peaceful intervention. They would go up uh, the men would go up to the, the men that were driving around um, in central Bloemfontein uh, looking for women to, to sleep with, and, and they would go up and they would say, what if this were your last day? Uh, the women, the, 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 the female pastors, he would, he would train to go and, um, and uh, uh, talk to the, talk to the, the victims, um, talk to those that were uh, the women and girls that were working on the streets in the sex trade and um, give them blankets, give them food, um, offer a way out. And he would train them all in self-defense. And there was a reason for this. Uh, uh, the adversaries that they were up against were brutal. Um, they were in many cases given the protection of local police according to informants that I had within the, within the police force. Um, and they were very uh, creative in their means of administering violence. Um, one of his street pastors was working on shutting down a brothel, and a trafficker came up behind him with a sharpened bicycle spoke and ran it through his lungs. Um, and he died ch choking like a dog on the streets, is the way Pastor Lombard put it. So I knew that at, um, at this point we were going to go out and we were going to find, um, we were going to find the, the trafficker. 
uh, we're going to find Jude, which was his nom de guerre. Um, and so we went to, um, we went to uh, the, the place where we knew the, that Jude's particular part of the network had taken over this, this place in, in Bloemfontein. Um, and um, that's Andre um, in the foreground. That's me, the shady figure behind him. Um, <laughs> Uh, and um, uh, as we were standing in front of this hotel, this was a place called the Maitland Hotel, where um, uh, it had been almost completely taken over by the traffickers and their accomplices. Uh, and the police knew this. Um, and the police uh, uh, response to it ranged from uh, uh, just leaving it alone, um, basically surrendering the building, to actually um, becoming involved with the traffickers in ways that, that I uh, reported on in Time magazine. Um, and as we were standing in front of the Maitland Hotel, um, Andre was describing what the different floors are. And uh, the third through fifth floors were wholly taken over by the traffickers. The, the third floors is where the, the, where the girls serviced the, the clients, uh, for the most part. Um, the, the fourth floor. Uh, was where what they called uh, traditional uh, sangomas, uh, traditional uh, healers, would um, perform illegal abortions, forced abortions on the girls if they got pregnant. Um, and the, uh, the fifth floor was what they called the breaking grounds, where new girls would be taken in, they would be roughed up. Um, it wouldn't be Jude who would do most of the beatings, or the, uh, but he would participate in the gang rapes. It was mostly uh, an enforcer by the name of Rasta who would also catch the, the, the runaways. His nom de guerre was Rasta. As we were looking at the Maitland, um, Melanie, um, who was extraordinary that she was out here in the middle of this, I mean, she, does not, she, she stood out, but she, like me, was wearing a hood. <laughs> um, uh, that's Andre. Um, Melanie lined up a shot that wound up running with the, um, the piece in Time magazine. And this shot was of a young girl who looked very cold and very alone. And at this point, we'd seen you know, somewhere on the, on the order of 40, 45 young women, mostly in twos and threes on street corners, um, working. And it's about, uh, it's hovering around freezing here. It's very cold. Um, and this young girl's wearing flip-flops. She was um, very cold, and I went up to her. Um, she was the first woman on the street that I talked to that evening. And I said, um, uh, you know, how old are you? Uh, and she said, uh, 15. Uh, and, and she said, um, and I said, where are you from? And she said, Eastern Cape. And, and I said, do you need help? She didn't speak much English, but she knew what I was saying, and she said yes. Um, and I pulled over one of the street pastors who spoke Tosa, um, uh, which was her native tongue. Um, and she translated. And in a very short period of time, it we found out that this was the best friend of, Elizabeth, of Sindiswa, who we'd seen an hour and a half earlier dying. Um, so I, I'm gonna, uh, not to leave you in suspense, but I promised to keep this short so we could do Q&A. So uh, I, uh, you can still download the, um, the piece on, on uh, time.com. <laughs> you can find out what happened next. Um, we wound up, uh, I, not, to, uh, not to spoil the story, but uh, also not to leave you in suspense, we wound up getting her out. Um, it was a struggle. We had to actually go into the crack den. Uh, she believed that, um, that Jude had cursed her possessions, which included a, a stack of clothes about that high. These are her only possessions in the world, a stack of clothes about that high and a Bible. Um, she believed that Jude had cursed those so that he could track her, which is why he had found her three times when she'd run away. What she didn't know was that uh, because many of her uh, uh, clients, several of her clients were policemen, 
the police were doing the tracking for, for Jude, and they brought her back each of these times. And uh, uh, we wound up getting her out. Um, we put her in a, uh, a, a shelter about uh, 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 eight hours away from Bloemfontein, um, well away from her traffickers. Uh, we wound up uh, finding her uh, uh, a, a scholarship to go back to school to do remedial courses and to get back on track and to learn computer skills. Um, and it's a stretch to call her lucky, uh, but she's HIV negative. Um, and in comparison with Sindiswa, who sadly passed away a week later, um, she's blessed. So with, with that, um, I, I just want to uh, uh, open the floor to talk about the issue broadly, um, to talk about the potential for your involvement, um, and to, to leave you, I hope, with a, with a sense of responsibility for this. Because, you know, the, uh, one of my favorite writers is Henry David Thoreau. Um, and in the, in the days before the first shot, two days before, actually, the first shots were fired at Fort Sumter, uh, beginning the, the Civil War, he'd been writing to a friend of his uh, uh, who'd been, this friend had been reading reports of slavery and the rumbling disunion in the New York Herald Tribune. And he wrote to this friend and he said, if you know of it, you're particeps criminis. You're a partner in the crime. What business have you, if you are an angel of light, to be pondering over the deeds of darkness? And, and he meant that as, uh, as an admonition, as, as a warning. He was torn between pacifism and abolitionism. But when I read that, I, I took it as an exhortation, and, and I hope all of you do as well. It's a call to arms. So if we could bring the lights up, let's have a conversation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Looks like there are microphones here, so don't all speak at once.
we have doctors that examine them that you know, work on any physical problems they have. We came from this America, and they won't be witnesses in a criminal case out of that same fear. And I was wondering if there's any place in the world that you've visited or any thoughts you have as to how you can break up this trafficking, because we see it, and it's a real problem. And you gave the figure 14 to 17,000 per year in Pennsylvania, you're right on the money. And it's a terrible, terrible problem, and I just would like to know whether you have any thoughts as to how the organization such as ours or the state generally can break it up. Boy, that's a... Um well, first of all, thank you for your commitment to the issue and for your work with Covenant House. Covenant House has been dealing with trafficking uh, for long before it was known as trafficking, um, and, and certainly dealing with the, the under, some of the underlying causes uh, of trafficking uh, for, uh, for far longer than, than the, the federal government, for example, had a law I want to be clear on one point. Do these children, they do want to go back or they don't, but they don't want to go back? They want to go back to their families, yeah. Um, so this is, this is an interesting uh, conundrum because I, in many trafficking situations, uh, what you find is that trafficking victims, they wanted to go from point A to point B. They wanted to come here, uh, but they didn't know they were going to be abused. They didn't know they were going to have their freedom taken away. They didn't know they were going to be compelled to pay off debts doing work that they didn't sign up for. Um, and uh, the reason they don't self-identify is because they're fearful of being sent back home. Uh, uh, that, that in the uh, in the testimonies that I've taken from from aid workers from. Uh, law enforcement officials, from uh, ICE officials, from those, uh, for example, the State Department's trafficking office, they'll, they'll say that's the, that is a, a too common story and it's vexing because it, it means they don't self-identify. Um, It's, well, I'll, I'll tell you that the key here is, is cross-border protection. Um, and also, one more question. Um, these are individuals who are not, uh, who, who are actually compelled to do some service, right? Uh, or are they just, are, are they here? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, 
a few more tools in terms of those, those cross-border collaborations. The challenge is how, you know, how you find and how you track those, those uh, victims once they return and how you, how you keep, keep an eye on them. And, and also keeping them safe here if they choose to testify. Um, That's of course a big, big challenge. I mean, remember, particularly in Central American countries, uh, you know, somebody comes from Guatemala, let's say, and they, and they're, um, you know, they come from a place where law enforcement too often is predatory, um, and it, the, the the challenge of overcoming that fear, um, which is a very rational fear, um, is is daunting. I will say there are good. Um, elements within um, within the, the federal government that are specifically focused on trafficking uh, and on victim-oriented approaches to, to fighting trafficking. That um, uh, the uh, the Justice Department, the Civil Rights Division of the Justice Department, um, uh, have agents that are you know are worth reaching out to if uh, if if you know. And I think going through the district uh, district attorney here is probably the the, the, the best route. Um, but beyond that, look for, um, and, and what, I've, what I've seen as being, uh, to your question, what I've seen as being most effective overseas, and there aren't many good examples to look for, but there are a couple, um, are, are NGOs or non-governmental organizations that partner with other trusted non-governmental organizations in the areas, in the, 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 the source countries. If, if, if you find some that, are, that you can build a relationship with and, 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 and build, a, build a trusting partnership with, which, is, which takes some legwork. <laughs> you know, I mean, there's, there's no shortcut to it, unfortunately. If these victims are going to go home, um, you got to, um, uh, you, you know, ultimately uh, there's a responsibility that, that, that you take, just as, you know, I, I felt with Elizabeth um, when she got back. Uh, to make sure that she was going to be safe, that, that she wasn't going to be free trafficked. Thank you for your work. Please. Um, hi, my name is Adam. I, uh, I'm a proud a graduate of the College of Nursing uh, here, and uh, I'm very proud to have you here. And uh, I'm, uh, I'm very grateful for the work that uh, you've done. I was devastated um, by a uh, portion of your book that involved um, the young woman with Down syndrome. Two daughters uh, from Eastern Europe, both had Down syndrome. I didn't think that, that was possible. And uh, so my my short question is: Do you have any idea her outcome? Um, and and then my the second part of that question is: uh, Our biggest concern, my wife and I, is the issue of aging out uh, for young young men and young women. Out of orphanages in Asia and Eastern Europe, in particular, um, what do you know about that? Is there one one uh, adoption facilitator in the training told me that there's a 70-70 club where 70 percent of the girls end up in some form of the sex trade, and 70 percent of the boys are incarcerated within the first year of, of that aging out time? What's, what's been done about that? Boy, that's a uh those are two um, excellent questions, and thank you for your commitment, um, Adam, on this. Uh, it, it's uh, obviously a transcendent commitment, and I, uh, I, I stand in awe of it. Um, on the on the issue of the young young woman, um, just to fill everybody else in, um, I presume there are a couple of people here that have read the book. So um, um, uh, this was a situation uh, near the Garden or Grail tournament. Similar situation to what happened later on that night in Bloemfontein. Uh, I I went in with uh, a, a couple of Confederates and, and we were offered a young woman for sale. Um, in fact, we were offered two young women for sale. One of them uh, 
had been held in a windowless room without any lighting. Um, and she was uh, crying uh, very hard when she was pulled out of this room. Uh, she had uh, makeup that was hastily put on her, um, the makeup had run, and um, she had Down syndrome. Uh, uh, I mean, very, uh, possibly fragile accident. Shields and I represent a, a residential program for women who have been trafficked for commercial sex work in Philadelphia. It's called Dawn's Place. I was just going to mention Dawn's Place. Uh, Thank you. I'm glad you preempted me. I, I just have a question. You mentioned about when you were in South Africa, uh, the British trip with the uh, the World Cup and, and the increase of trafficking. Um, we recently had the Super Bowl, 
and there was a lot of mobilization of, of a lot of good people, a lot of college students, uh, to, to bring that awareness that the increase of trafficking. But there seems within the community of people that work with people who are trafficked for commercial sex, uh, a little discrepancy in how they feel about it. We have Rachel Lloyd from GEMS, uh, the um, Sex Workers Project, and even I think Polaris Project, who felt that that was a misuse of resources and that there's no appreciable uptick in trafficking. And uh, so there's two schools. I myself personally think that the more we make people aware of trafficking, and even if we have that event to, to do it, that, that's a good thing. But I was wondering if you had any information or insight about that. Any, any insights? Um, well, all, all the organizations and people you mentioned, Rachel, uh, who, uh, uh, I'm, by the way, commend you for your work with, uh, with uh, Dawn's Place. I, I've been meaning to mention that as a local, uh, local resource for anybody interested in getting involved. Uh, in, in the fight against trafficking, um, uh, and as a, uh, a based here in uh, Philadelphia, uh, runs in one of the only shelters for human trafficking here in, uh, in, in uh, Philadelphia. Uh, and um, uh, on the issue of the Super Bowl, yeah, it's it's a. Uh, I mean, look, the reason Time Magazine sent me to um, uh, South Africa was one of the hooks. Was hey, here's this you know huge sporting event. There's going to be a lot of coverage on it. Let's you know, uh, let's see if if there is a if there's a connection here. Actually, it wasn't quite so. Um, uh, the, the the process was I had been giving a talk in Pretoria um, uh, several months before I went there on assignment, um, and uh, uh, police captain, uh, uh, detective, sorry, uh, had been. Had been plotting um, uh, uh, where the, these local brothels were, these tiny little ramshackle brothels were, uh, and this guy did extraordinary work. Uh, I mean, he would go out. Uh, he had uh, you know 15 different license plates. Um, uh, he had you know 10 different uh, SIM cards. Uh, all these aliases, and this guy was very uh, had to move his house twice because the traffickers found him. Um, but he would plot where these small brothels were um, and where uh, trafficked women almost inevitably were. Um, and uh, they were, uh, uh, you can see it on Google Maps, they were being drawn around the, um, the, the, the construction sites for the, for the, uh, for the World Cup, um, for the stadiums. Now, in a, in a situation like that, um, there's, a, there's a couple of things that are going on. One, there's just more activity around it. There's more economic activity. Two, there's construction workers. Um, uh, three, there's a lot of aspirational traffickers who, like the ones that I was talking to, were saying that there is going to be, um, we feel like we're going to be making a lot of money here. Um, with regards to the Super Bowl, I, 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 I tend to agree with you that I think it, you know, any opportunity to really um, uh, shine a spotlight on this is, uh, and do it in a responsible way um, is, 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 a, is a good one, um, as long as it's responsible. And I, and I think the, um, the challenge is, in the past, um, there have been all, there's been a lot of talk about uh, an uptick in trafficking, but but there hasn't been able to uh, be the kind of metrics uh, following it. The challenge, as you know, is that it, it too often happens without uh, uh, outside of sight. So it could very well be happening. We're just not seeing it. And um, uh, the other thing to bear in mind, and the other thing I talked to Rachel a lot about, uh, and, and Brad and Polaris uh, and, and others, um, is the uh, there is there's no question that prostitution writ large is always exploitative. Um, it's often abusive. Um, but if you talk to adult women working in prostitution, they, 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 they'll tell uh, oftentimes different stories. You can't put all of them in the same uh, category. Not all of them would self-identify as victims. Um, and so it's a it's a it's a challenging.
challenging thing to say, well, you know, here we see a lot more evidence of the sex trade. Um, you, you really have to go in and take the narratives from these, these women and, and, and allow them a safe space where they can, um, they can actually open up, uh, open up their hearts as, as you know, uh, as, as Father Peter was saying, uh, this is this is a real opportunity for nurses, I think, to to engage with those uh, with those workers in first and foremost a non-judgmental interaction, um, and then give them the opportunity to talk about their lives and possibly get help if that's what they need. Please. Hi. Um, so. This is like a very frustrating thing that everything you talk about is like human slavery. The people that are actually like in charge of trafficking, in charge of slavery, are their motives really just for money? Like, is that really all they're doing it for? Like, do they even see these people as people? And, like, I mean, you being actually in the field and doing it, like, is there any way to actually get them to try to change their mind frame about like what they're doing and that like these are humans that you see? Boy, that's a that's a deep question. Um, you know, part of my Quaker upbringing that I always take with me, uh, uh, and part of the what almost any meeting will say when you ask what Quakers believe, uh, is that there's that of God in everyone, that the divine spark animates every man, and um, as a local African-American radio host said to me when I said that on our show, she said, yeah, but some, sometimes, honey, you got to look real hard. <laughs> um, and, um, and that's true with, with these, you know, a lot of these traffickers. There is a tremendous economic incentive to, to exploit others and a tremendous economic incentive to suppress that natural human empathy, um, uh, and a tremendous economic incentive to bring in all kinds of excuses for just the most appalling uh, actions and behavior. Um, and so I think uh, a, a key part of that, you, you, can't, you can't separate um, the, 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 the two real action points, uh, two real action avenues that, that you have to pursue. One, uh, I don't think you foreclose on the moral. Um, and I, uh, I, I think you reach out with the idea that there is that of God in everyone, and, and, and you, you seek to connect with traffickers, and you seek to, to get them to see the humanity in, in others. Um, uh, and two, um, and this is, I haven't touched on this at all, but this is what I'm doing now um, uh, as part of uh, as one of the co-founders of town investment management, you break their backs economically um, by what, what we're doing is um, looking at uh, theaters and industries uh, where uh, there is endemic human trafficking, also environmental degradation, uh, corruption, operational inefficiency. But you know, the starting point for me is worker dignity. Um, uh, and we shine a, a very bright light across those theaters. Um, we invest in those companies that have problems but can change. And we um, push those other companies to the margins. We work with brands um, that are buying the products. We're starting the apparel industry. We work with brands that are buying the products and we say, hey, you want to pay the same, same cost uh, you want, you know, faster lead times you want, um, you want uh, quality, that's, that's all fine. Um, we're saying you can do all that and, and, uh, and uh, source from workers that are paid at a living wage. Source from workers, um, and of course, you know, the, the folks talked about the apparel industry and it's called the, those wages, slave wages. Um, and, and I think, you know, to, I wouldn't use that term exactly, but I would say um, you don't need to be paying $38 an hour. Um, you can still make very healthy margins doing, uh, uh, doing the workers a bit better than that. Um, and so we come in to each of these engagements with a rough deal size around $50 million, um, to actually create a 
real force for change within those industries to, to create, to, we hope, spark a race to the top or start where there's been a race to the bottom. Um, you know, within all that, uh, does moral suasion play, play a role? Absolutely. Um, you know, and this is, this is a big part of bundling demand. Um, and this is a big part of the role that all of you have to play, and all of you do play when you buy things. Uh, when you buy things and, and uh, you either are concerned about their, their problems, you're either concerned about where they come from and who made them and whose hands touched them before they reached you, um, or, or you're not. Right now, there is a, um, there are precious few resources where you can actually find out how most of your posts get to you. Increasingly, there will be. There's something called the California Transparency and Supply Chains Act, which requires any companies that make over $100 million and file tax receipts in the state of California, it's about 3,500 companies, to publicly declare on their website what they're doing to monitor and combat slavery in supply chains. And they don't have to do anything, but they have to at least say, we don't do anything. Um, and then it's up to all of you to make a decision how you want to buy. You mentioned your uh, personal morals against buying people and, and purchasing slaves. I'm wondering if you could speak to the organizations that purchase people out of slavery with the intent to liberate them, and is that sustainable? And could you speak a little bit more about what other sustainable options there are for the average citizen to battle this? Great, terrific. Um, <laughs> boy, <laughs> tough questions. Uh, the, 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 um, uh, but good ones. The, so I began, uh, as Lynn said in the intro, uh, one of my early assignments was for Newsweek um, uh, embedding with a group called Christian Solidarity International, which was um, raising funds across the United States, uh, largely in Sunday schools, um, uh, uh, you know, and, and uh, at secular schools as well. Um, but to to, to buy slaves, in theory, to buy slaves out of bondage. Now, um, the, the theater for this was Southern Sudan at the time uh, of the, the late latter years of the Second Civil War. Um, and the challenge was, and this, is a, this is a very complex humanitarian situation, um, um, that uh, did not lend itself to quick fixes, um, frankly. And what I found was, whatever the initial intention of buying these slaves was, um, it had essentially become a, um, a funnel, um, a convenient cover for um, giving uh, large amounts of hard currency to what was then a cash-starved um, uh, insurgency, and uh, I, you know, I think you could be of good conscience and really support the, the efforts of, of the Southern rebels of the SPM. Um, but I do think um, one should be honest when fundraising about what the money is going towards. Um, and what um, what I what I found when I went back, um, so, so I embedded, like other journalists had done before me, with this group. What they didn't know was that I then went back um, on a UN Cessna, spent several weeks there on my own, found a lot of the returned slaves, found that they had you know, been in terrible situations, but many of them had never been abducted, many of them had never been taken as slaves. Um, they've been victims of war. Um, you're talking about a part of the globe um, in a time when almost everybody was a victim or a perpetrator. Um, one of those two. There are a lot of victims and a few brutal perpetrators. And um, uh, so, you know, quick fixes uh, make us feel very, very good, uh, you know, and make for good uh, fundraising fodder. Uh, unfortunately, it's the long, hard work of restoration that groups like Covenant House and Dawn's Place do. Um, it's the long, hard work of, of prevention um, that I hope we're going to be doing by reshaping the 
business leaders and industries. Um, that's that's what needs the most engagement. Um, and and I think the um, uh, the degree to which um, average citizens can get involved in this can't be uh, can't be overstated. I mean, there are so many uh, so many uh, avenues to. Uh, to engage in, particularly on the commercial side, particularly on the consumer side. Um, uh, but, uh, but beyond that, I think uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the restoration, um, many of the best groups um, have the worst fundraising operations <laughs> um, because they're too busy doing the actual work on the ground to, to save lives. Um, and and so I think uh, you know getting involved with groups uh, like Polaris, like uh, like Dawn's Place, like Covenant House, um, uh, and really kind of um, not only uh, fundraisers uh, but also uh, volunteering your time and committing to volunteering your time. Um, I think the challenge is a lot of people will do this in, you know, as sort of an ad hoc uh, thing. Uh, when, you're, when you're running one of these uh, organizations, um, what really helps is if you get people to kind of get in and, and dedicate their time over the course of years, get, get trained up on how to do victim services. Um, and look, this is a great place for it, you know. Um, I mean, here at the, uh, uh, you know, those of you who are in the School of Nursing have such an opportunity to, to marry your, um, uh, your, your passion with your, with your training on this. I'll take one more. There we go. May I just thank you oh, on behalf of the College of Nursing. Um, I'm so pleased that you were able to be with us. Thank you. Uh, he speaks out against uh, 
uh, the exploitation, the sexual exploitation of children with, with a passion. Um, my understanding of what Ford is trying to do, it's kind of controversial, but uh, hopefully effective, uh, is that they, they invade the computers of people that are uh, uh, that are uh, using or uh, trafficking in child pornography. Uh, and um, it's a, uh, apparently, it, it starts out very soft where they'll get a little message saying, um, hey, we're watching. <laughs> this is Ashton <actually> Kutcher. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, but it's, um, uh, uh, you know, Ashton's point in doing all this, in a direct response to your question, um, was when, when people go and they consume pornography, um, it's, you know, it's no different than, um, uh, uh, than uh, well, when people go and consume pornography, they do, you don't know um, the age of the, the people portrayed in there. Um, uh, and mixed up on a lot of these websites, um, which are sort of aggregators of this, are a whole bunch of un completely unregulated uh, images and videos. And the question that consumers have to ask themselves is, am I watching great one tape? Am I watching um, somebody being uh, uh, a child, for example, uh, or, or a woman being coerced uh, into doing something that is you know, uh, obviously horribly degrading, and by watching this, am I furthering her degradation? Um, and I think those are um, those are important questions, um, and those are, uh, and I think what Ashton is doing uh, is is edgy. I hope it works, um, uh, but beyond that, um, I think all of us have a role. Um, you know, we don't need to be tech entrepreneurs um, uh, invading the computers of, of others. We just have to take responsibility for what comes over ours. Thank you.